All right, welcome back. In this video, and actually the next couple of videos, we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, and instead of talking about the ACI strength requirements, we're going to turn our attention to some of the detailing. Okay, and particularly how do we establish the anchorage of a bar? How do we get that FY of 60 KSI that we've been assuming all along? What, what do we have to do to ensure that physically we can get that, that particular value? So we're going to kind of spend some time talking about, you know, bond and some of the detailing and some of the, um, you know, some other requirements that, that show up as you try to literally provide the details for a design. All right. And then eventually we'll get into some flexural cutoffs as well. All right. So without further ado, here we go. All right. So the reinforcement details, like I said, I've broken this down into a couple of packs. They're fairly lengthy, but we'll get through this fairly quickly. Most of this material is located in ACI chapter 25. Okay. Um, up to this point, we have made some very fundamental assumptions. Um, back on like the first or second video, when we started talking about the interaction between steel and concrete, okay, we made the assumption that the strain in the steel was the same as the strain in the concrete at a given location along a bar. Okay, now this may or may not actually be the, be the case, but at a bar, you know, that, um, we assumed that there was no slip, that bond was perfect and so forth that you know at this point on a rebar the concrete coming into contact you know if this is my bar coming across that if i took a look at the strut and the strain in the steel and then the strain in the concrete immediately adjacent to it they were the same value that that one side wasn't allowed to slip relative to the other okay that's what we mean when we say that okay but you know we've also made the you know the statement that you know there has to be an interaction between the steel and the concrete all right and so what we want to look at is kind of how does this interaction develop so what we've got here is kind of a, a simply supported beam with some load on it doesn't really matter what that you know for a singly reinforced section on this we would have some cross section and i would have a rebar in the bottom of this thing that is carrying some tensile force and then I would have a compressive block that we figured out from Whitney or whatever and some shear forces in a moment on this. This would be our general free body diagram. All right now usually on this we were looking for the tension guy to be some AS FY kind of thing and then we kind of varied it a little bit and said well how about AFSS. Okay either way getting this value does not occur instantly. I could not you know count on FY at the very end of the bar there has to be some amount of anchorage that exists, okay, or some amount of forces that are established between the concrete and the steel that help me to get to that force. Because if I draw a free body diagram of the bar, which I'll do a little bit later on, okay, as we start to kind of look at it, here's my bar. If I pull it out of the concrete, right, I'm pulling on it with a tensile force of ASFS, okay, and all around the perimeter of this bar, there are stresses that develop or micro forces okay that are acting on this bar that are helping to hold the bar in the concrete now it could be due to a number of things it could be the deformities in the bar most bars have some sort of ribs or, or you know protrusions that allow concrete to push against uh, we could get some sort of chemical adhesion you know an interaction between the two materials itself you know any number of things that could happen but there is some finite length that's required in order to provide enough surface area for all of these bond stresses if you will to be able to produce or resist my anchorage force it's here okay all right now again we're looking at a di uh, the bar diameter of db and we're looking at being able to develop a force of t for a given size of bar okay it's that ld is the guy that we're kind of working with and there's some rules and some some subtleties that we have to look at as we start to kind of play with that ld but what chapter 25 in aci tries to do is they try to quantify this ld length how much length do you need before you can actually count on it to give you the force that you're expecting Okay, all right. So the way that it kind of starts to work on this is you can do just kind of a quick, uh, quick calculation, if you will. All right, that we can say that over a given length of a bar, okay, that we're looking then at you know what would be the cross-sectional area, the stress that I need to develop, you know, over a given length would be equal to the stress times its area it has to be equal to what we call the average bond stress that's acting on the surface area of that cylinder. So again, we're looking at this. Okay, and I'm trying to figure out that area because that's where the bond is acting is, and it goes all the way around 
around this size, okay? So this is the circumference, this is the length, this would be your LD parameter, okay? And then this would be whatever your bond stress is, all right? And so we could actually solve for the actual average bond stress on this is delta FS, dB, and then over 4 LD would be that equation. So if I knew my, what my limit was, I could tell you, do we have enough? Okay, now there are several elements that kind of help us define bond, and we'll show why this isn't the most convenient way to work this. It's uh, very, very difficult to quantify. Okay, so bond, which is kind of the, you know, how the bar is anchored to the concrete, is made up of three fundamental behaviors. Okay, the first one is that there is friction. Okay, and this is caused by forces that are developed as the bar attempts to move past the surrounding friction. I mean, imagine the old, you know, we've all done the physics problem with the block on the ramp, right? And we talked about friction acting up there. This guy wants to go this way, a friction force is induced. That's all we're talking about. And it happens between steel and concrete as well. Um, we mentioned the chemical adhesion, which is kind of a chemical glue-like stickiness that exists between concrete, uh, the concrete paste and the steel rebar at the interface. Okay, and then the other one is the mechanical interlock that's caused by bearing forces you know, on the ridges of a deformed bar. A deformed bar has these humps that go all the way around it. And what happens is, is I pull on the bar, when I pour the concrete, it gets down in these little grooves and produces these micro forces that are helping to help restrain it. And depending on how big these, these humps are, these forces can change as well. And they act all the way around the perimeter of the bar on those ridges, okay? And then the sum of all of those is what I need to be able to, that's the amount of T that I can develop. Again, this is not an easy calculation to figure out. It's more of a theoretical exercise than anything, okay? All right, now what happens and why bond is so so tricky is, is that friction and chemical adhesion don't last very long, okay? Because part of the reason is, is that as I pull on this bar, the Poisson effect tells me that as the length of the bar gets longer, the diameter has to get smaller. Well, if the diameter gets smaller, this bar interface is starting to pull away from the surrounding concrete. Okay, and so that destroys the chemical adhesion and the friction themselves, and they no longer are not as, as valid on those, okay? And they will decrease, you know, because that bar diameter is decreasing, All right? And again, that was what we call as Poisson's effect. Okay, the other thing that can happen is, is that as I pull on this bar, I can start to get cracking in here. Okay, and when that happens, then all of a sudden these lengths could start to change. You know, and you know, if I crack too close to this, then I can't count on the T. Okay, and so there's you know, kind of, this is kind of a plot of, you know, some experimental work that was done to look at bond stresses along the length of the bar. Uh, the bar okay, now, that being said, we were talking about an average bond stress. In reality, the bond stress is not constant anywhere along the surface of this bar okay it varies along the length you know and you know um so instead of calculating a mu average or a mu maximum or a mu minimum what aci has chosen to do is they've chosen to use a concept known as the developmental length okay rather than that average bond stress okay and so that's what we're going to focus on today is so what are the aci provisions for developmental length Okay, now, developmental length is required for bars in compression, bars in tension. Those are predominantly where we're going to be looking at them. Okay, we're not counting on any other physical anchorage on this. Because, you know, if I took a bar, you know, through a section, you know, took it all the way to the end of the beam, and then I welded a plate on the end of that bar out on the end, I would get huge bearing forces. And I could get, you know, I could basically drive the LD required to zero based off of this. And so sometimes in really high loads or very big bars, I have to do that to be able to provide the anchorage that I need, especially if I have a high moment value or need a high tensile force very close to the end of the bar. Sometimes I don't have an alternative. I have to come up with a better way to, to, to anchor this thing. Okay, so that's kind of one of the things that we're going to look at this. All right, so the heart of this method uh, for bars in tension, the developmental length, it comes out of ACI 25.4.2.2. Okay, and it contains the requirements for the development length of the deformed bars um, in tension. All right. So if I go in and let's zoom this in a little bit so we can kind of see the table a little bit, see if that helps. Okay. There are two basic formulas that are working on this, and this is a sample pulled out of the ACI code. Let's see if I can fix the focus on it. How about that one? Okay, that's not too horrible. Let me pause. All right. 
that's about as well as we're going to do. Um, like I say, if you've got your, your, your ACI code manual, pull that out because what's important on this, and I apologize that it's a little small, is the subscripts on these little guys start to kind of make a difference on there. Okay, now in the packets, if you're one of my students, I've written all those out so you can actually see them, but I wanted you, know, you to be able to at least see where it's coming from in the code as well. Okay, and so there's some criteria that you have to look at. Okay, you have two different formulas. One is when I have a number six or smaller bar, and one is when I have a seven or larger bar. Typically, the larger the bar, the more force it can hold, the more development length you need. Okay, and so that's why they kind of change the formulas. Okay, um, number sixes and smaller produce the smallest LDs that we can look at. All right, and so this is the case where the clear spacing of bars or wires being developed or lap spliced is not less than dB, clear cover at least dB, and stirrups or ties throughout the LD not less than the code minimum, or the clear spacing of bars or wires being developed or lap spliced at least 2 dB and clear cover at least dB. If either of those cases apply, you have to read it kind of carefully, you're up in one of these two. Okay, or you could use kind of the catch-all and run down and grab these guys, okay? Now, for... Um, for what we have happening here, okay. All right, sorry about that. So you can see kind of the, the nature of the formulas. Okay, now this is what's recommended for um, kind of deformed bars and deformed wires. Okay, the ACI does give you another version of the equation. It's been around for many, many years, and I kind of like this one because it actually gives you a little bit better results, but it requires you to compute another another value okay all right and so let me zoom this thing back out a little bit okay all right and so our developmental length then is going to be 3 over 40 times lambda again lambda is that lightweight factor for normal weight concrete that's 1.0 times the ratio of fy to square root of f prime c and then there are these three factors across the top psi s psi t psi e okay and then we have another parameter on the bottom which is cb and ktr Okay, CB plus KTR over CB, and then all that gets multiplied by the bar diameter. So the bigger the bar, the bigger LD is, just based off of that guy alone. All right, so this is the equation 25.4.2.4a. Okay, um, and we have a minimum LD of 12 inches, okay, and that's another provision that's kind of hidden in there. And they scatter these details out all over that chapter, and so it's kind of hard to, to track them down. So I hope it's, you know... I'm trying to kind of point you in the right direction to find all those things. You really have to read that section very, very closely to make sure that you don't miss anything. Okay, so the biggest thing that we take away from all of this are the parameters that we're going to look at, and that's this term right here. Okay, so we're going to talk about psi s, psi t, and psi e as we start to look, and then there's another one as well. Okay, all right, so here are what our factors are. Okay, the factors are defined, okay, okay, in which... Um, we're going to be looking at table 25.4.2. Let me see if I can get the focus back. I'm about one click off. A little better. Okay, all right. All right, so let's talk about um, factors that are affecting this. Okay, the first one is the size of the bar being developed. We've already talked about dB being in the equation, all right? Um, coming up with the factors is actually fairly easy, and in fact, I've generated a spreadsheet that basically I can put in a bar size and it will automatically compute a lot of these factors for me, okay, um, and some check boxes for some of the others, but it's not, a, LD is a very useful one to make a spreadsheet for because there's so many little things that you can change that you're constantly doing this calculation. All right, so basically for a number seven and larger bar, psi S is 1.0. For a number six and smaller, psi s is 0 0.8. So if you look, that's a 20% difference on here. So really, this is one of the reasons if you can, if you can get down to a number six bar, you can actually decrease the developmental length by 20% right off the bat. And that doesn't include any of the other factors that go into this, right? But um, it's calibrated because in flexure, a lot of times you're looking at number eights, number nines, number tens. That's why they chose this. But if you get to really small bars, they just do a lot better job in transferring the forces. So all of these factors will come out of this table 25.4.2.5. Pull that down a little bit so you can see it. Okay, so if you want to flip over to that one, you can kind of read along here. The factors that we have, we have lightweight concrete factor. Again, it's 1.0 when it's normal weight, and then there's some other rules that apply for lightweight, and lightweight where tensile strength is a certain value. Um, we have an epoxy factor. Is the bar epoxy coated or not? Okay, and you can see that, you know, for, um, for raw steel, 
okay, or for, uh, it will be, um, that's what we call uncoded. You can see the epoxy factor is 1.0, and then we have some other values. Um, so that's our uncoded, which is actually better because what epoxy is is, is kind of this um, plastic coating. You've seen it in whenever you you know dry pass a construction project, like on a bridge or something. You see those all the steel laying around, and it's got that green. It's usually it's a green color, kind of a kind of a lime green coating on it. That's epoxy. Okay, what it does is it's a, it's a preventative for corrosion and helps protect the steel once it's inside. But it does provide a little bit of slip, and so we have to adjust our anchorage as a result of that. Okay. Um, so for, for epoxy coating, okay, or zinc in epoxy dual coated reinforcements for all other conditions, it's 1.2. Epoxy coated or zinc uh, with clear cover less than three um, bar diameters or clear spacing less than six bar diameters, they bump you all the way up to 1.5. Most of the time, most detailing, we can get away with the 1.2. This is for very, again, you've got very small cover again. So what's happening is that the concrete is cracking and allowing the corrosive elements to get up into the bar more likely so they're going to make you have a larger developmental length for that okay or if i have clear spacing between bars that's very very tight then i can get cracking that occurs between the bars and so there's a transmission mechanism for corrosion and, and things like that on it as well okay all right the um so that's our coating factor that's psi e the next one is what we call the bar location factor and it's a top bar and this one's kind of interesting okay this one's called psi t Okay, and it is um, 1.0 when we have less than 12 inches of fresh concrete, and it's 1.3 when there's more than 12 inches of concrete. All right, and so this kind of is a construction penalty, if you will. Okay, and what this is, is this is, a, you know, is it a top bar or is it a bottom bar? Okay, and anytime you put a bar in and you have a bunch of wet concrete below it, okay, usually the concrete comes in from the top, and then I stick a vibrator down in there to kind of help consolidate things around my stirrups or just to kind of get all the air pockets out of it. And in doing so, what happens is any air that's in here starts to rise up through the cross section and it becomes trapped on the bottom side of this bar. So now you got this microscopic air pocket there. Well, that air pocket destroys the bond at the location of it. Okay, because now there's air instead of concrete that's attaching the seal. So there has to be a penalty associated with that. Okay, and so this is what we call the top bar requirement. Okay, now to make sure that they don't get too carried away with the formulas, they do have kind of a get out of jail free card that um, is a footnote of this table that the maximum value um, of psi e times psi t um, is um, 1.7 that this po this product needs to be less than or equal to 1.7 if you calculate this because you had a really bad psi t value and then you had you know the worst possible epoxy coat this number can go upwards of like 1.9 or something so they're saying all right within we're, we're reasonable so so they give you an arbitrary limit of 1.7 this is located actually in this microscopic footnote of this table okay so again it's kind of you got to know where you're looking for and you got to know it's there to find it but that's one of the the little gotchas that can and i'll be honest i forget to use this one most of the time but um but it's there so all right okay the next factor that was in the equation that we saw was the bar spacing factor okay it was our cb okay and so if i look at what i've got here is that bars close to edges of a cross section or close to adjacent bars may interfere with bond stresses that are required for development all right and so what you imagine is is that i have a bar with a force in it that there's a certain ring around this thing in which i i can load the concrete you know or load the bond to help provide the anchorage okay and so they call that the radius of cb all right, now, if you think about positioning of bars within a cross-section, things that will affect how big that circle can get have to do with, you know, in this case, how close can I get to the bar, okay? How close am I to the edge, you know, and so forth and so on. So in this case, I have a bar that's basically, this radius is being controlled by either that vertical edge or that bottom edge. That's what the radius is set for. So it has to do with that cover requirement, okay? Or in this case, I have bars that are in from the vertical edge, but they're still making contact with that bottom edge. That would be my CB value. Okay. And then for spacing, you have to look at, well, how big can I get based off of that contact point? Well, it would be half of the spacing between the two bars. All right. I can't go any larger. These circles are not allowed to overlap. You can't claim bond stress from, you know, from the same area for, for multiple bars. It just doesn't work. All right. Because what happens is that in each of these scenarios is that if this circle, you know, if these circles are not big enough, I can actually end up with 
a lower limiting stress value, okay, which means that cracking can occur and it basically jumps along the bars, okay. Likewise, if I get too close to the edge, then I can crack it out to the edges like this. And then if I get too close to the bottom, I get this one. And in flexure, a lot of times I'll pick up this other one that's kind of a diagonal cracking as well. So there's all sorts of all sorts of detailing that comes in this. But that's how we come up with our CV value. Okay. The other factor that we had then was this KTR. And this is a transverse reinforcement index. Okay. And by transverse reinforcement, we mean if I have a bar running horizontal, it's any steel that's providing restraint to the bar, you know, in the perpendicular direction, right? And so KTR is actually calculated as 40 um, ATR over S times N, okay? ATR is the total cross-sectional area of all transverse reinforcement that crosses the potential plane of splitting. Okay, S is the spacing of the transversing reinforcement, and N is the number of bars that are being developed at that location. Okay, so the number of longitudinal bars, if you will. Okay, now, like I say, this is there's a lot to remember here, and ACI says, well, you can conservatively take KTR is equal to zero as a simple design simplification, okay, or as a common design simplification, and I often choose to do that. I just take KTR of zero, and then we're, we're off to the races. Okay, and in fact, that's kind of how they come up with that, that, that first formula that I showed you, all right? All right, so that's kind of the basics of our bond. At this point, uh, students in my class, you guys will be looking at calculating some basic developmental lengths. And what I've got here is just a simple problem. Okay, I've got a rectangular cross section, a cantilever that has tensile steel in the top. Okay, and we have a height of 18 inches and a B of 16 inches. Okay, and I've given you some section properties, and I also give you the cover of the concrete on the edge. On the top edge is two inches, and on the sides is one and a half everywhere else. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out what the developmental length is. And so all you're doing is basically going through and you're running down these values. Okay, so psi t, psi e, psi s, and this KTR parameter. Now, um, so you'll tell me what your numerical value is here, and then in the justification, you tell me why you chose that. Like, you know, is it a top bar? You know, will that set psi t to a specific value? Was it epoxy coated? Yes. That's what I'm looking for in that statement there. Okay, that you can basically apply the rules that I just showed you. Okay. Now, once you do that, then you're going to develop the, the straight bar developmental length, LD. Okay, and then you're going to figure out, and then I have you do some experiments of, well, what's the developmental length of a number 14? And what's the developmental length for a number 6 using all the criteria? And then basically, can you make a decision of whether or not um, these bars will fit into a 4-foot long beam? Okay, and I'll give you a hint. The 14 probably won't fit. Okay, and that's that I need too much length, so we have to come up with an alternative. And there are alternatives that we'll talk about in the next video. But for now, we'll stop this one there. That's the first of our reinforcement detailing packets. And we'll, we'll, we'll continue on in the next video with some more. We'll start talking about hooks and things like that and other things that we can do. So anyway, hope it made sense. Um, this one's not too bad, really. It's very procedural. It's just a matter of knowing where to look and defining those requirements. So I hope, hope I've done a, a clear enough job of illustrating the points and the considerations that are that are occurring as you look at bond in the developmental length. Okay, as always, if there's anything that's unclear, please, please leave me a, a message down below in the comments. And then, you know, as always, please like the video and please um, subscribe to our channel. That will help us out. So, anyway, I um, hope you all have a good evening. I will see you all in the next video when we get into other developmental length issues. Anyway, uh, take care. Uh, good night. Happy engineering.